Patients with diabetes are prone to developing a number of different secondary manifestations. In fact, one of the jokes in medical school was if you have a very complicated case and you can't figure out what it is, you can always say diabetes, cancer, and maybe sometimes lupus, and you can figure out a way to make the symptoms make sense. But one of the most common uh, secondary manifestations of diabetes is diabetic retinopathy. In fact, this is the most common cause of blindness in the US. Small blood vessels are especially susceptible to high blood glucose levels seen in diabetes. And of course, the retinal arteries are no exception. Diabetic retinopathy occurs in two stages, a non-proliferative stage and of course, a proliferative stage. So, the non-proliferative phase usually consists of macular edema, hemorrhages, as well as retinal ischemia. Now, with enough time, this can progress to the more proliferative phase, which is where new blood vessels begin to grow. So you have new blood vessel growth in the proliferative phase. These new vessels are fragile and are very susceptible to bursting, further damaging the retina. Diabetic retinopathy can progress without any obvious symptoms of vision loss. Thus, a regular eye exam is very important in patients with diabetes. Now, of course, there's no cure for this sort of retinopathy, but early treatment can help curb vision loss. Treatment today usually consists of either laser therapy or um, corticosteroids. You can also see anti-VEGF therapy or vitrectomy, which is a removal of the vitreous. Retinal vein occlusion is self-explanatory. It is blockage of retinal veins and can occur in the central vein or in one of its branches. This usually develops secondary to arterial atherosclerosis, which then results in compression of the surrounding veins. This is typically seen in elderly patients that will complain of sudden blurred vision or a central visual field defect. On a fundoscopic exam, you will typically see hemorrhages as seen here. Retinal detachment is a separation of the retina from its supporting layers. It can occur without a cause but is associated with trauma to the eye, previous eye surgery, and diabetes. The retinal blood vessels can bleed and cloud the vitreous fluid. Patients will present with bright flashes of light in the peripheral vision, blurry vision, or blindness in part of or all of the visual field. It is important to realize that the nerves can remain intact, as seen here. If this occurs, there will not be any afferent pupillary defects. Retinal artery occlusion is caused by embolization of plaque material from the ipsilateral internal carotid or the ophthalmic artery. So who's your typical patient? Well, it's a middle-aged man with carotid artery disease presenting with sudden painless and complete loss of vision. On the optho exam, you see pallor of the optic disc as seen here. You might also see what's called boxcar segmentation of blood in the retinal veins. In addition, you may see a cherry red spot of the fovea because the retina is quite thin at that location. An example of that is seen here. Now in what other disease would you see a cherry red spot? This disease is caused by hexosaminidis A deficiency. The answer here is Tay-Sachs disease. And cherry red spot is one of the uh, most common clues that you will get for this disease. Retinitis pigmentosa is one of the most common inherited forms of blindness as a result of retinal degeneration. Now, although there are many different gene mutations that can result in the retinitis pigmentosa phenotype, this disease typically affects rods first. And that is why patients typically present with loss of night vision. In fact, loss of night vision is usually a very good clue to point you towards retinitis pigmentosa on the board exam. Other symptoms can also include tunnel vision as well as loss of central vision.
One other thing you should look out for on your exam is the black bone spicule pigmentation that can occur on the retinal epithelium in retinitis pigmentosa. In fact, that last part of the, the name, pigmentosa, should help you to remember that this is one of the uh, commonly seen presentations on the fondoscopic exam. But first, we will have a flash quiz. A patient walks into your office. He has extreme pain in his eye as well as vision loss that occurred rapidly. What drug should you definitely not use? I kind of really set you up for this one. You should not use epinephrine. This patient has acute closed angle glaucoma. Epinephrine leads to midriasis. And as we discussed, this will further close the angle and actually make the problem a lot worse. Retinitis is simply an infection of the retina. Now, the most common cause of retinitis is CMV infection. And this typically occurs in immunocompromised patients. And this is what you're looking at here. In the fundoscopic exam, you can see inflammation, which can manifest as cotton wool exudates and retinal hemorrhages. Now, what type of virus is CMV? It is, of course, a herpes virus, which means that it has what type of nucleic acid? Herpes double-stranded DNA. Untreated, it leads to progressive vision loss as well as blindness. Now, you should know the treatment for CMV, and that includes Foscarnet as well as Janciclovir. Papilledema is a sign seen on optical exam of increased intracranial pressure. Essentially, when you look through a fundoscope, the optic disc margin is blurry, as you can see here. Increased intracranial pressure usually presents with headache, blurry vision, and cranial nerve 6 nerve palsy. But to establish the diagnosis, you must use fundoscopy. It is important to remember that papilledema is a sign that there is increased pressure in the brain, but it doesn't tell you anything about the diagnosis. For instance, a 26-year-old obese woman comes to you with headaches, nausea, vomiting, and visual changes. You look into her eyes and you see this. Her MRI has no abnormalities. What is the most likely diagnosis? The answer is pseudotumor cerebri, also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This is usually seen in young obese women. It is increased intracranial pressure resulting from an unknown cause, and the main symptoms are headaches, nausea, and vomiting. The papilledema seen on exam is the clue that there is increased intracranial pressure. Of course, there would need to be an absence of some other cause after clinical tests to arrive at this diagnosis. Let's talk about pupillary control. There are two terms that are frequently confused. Pupillary constriction, also known as meiosis, seen here, and dilation, also known as medriasis. Now, one way to remember this is that the D in dilation is also in medriasis. Pupils constrict due to parasympathetic tone provided by cranial nerve 3 through the Edinger westfall nucleus. Pupils dilate due to primary neurons in the hypothalamus, which synapse in the lateral horn. Next, sympathetic tone is provided by the vagus through T1 preganglionic nerves. This leads to the superior cervical ganglion, to a postganglionic sympathetic nerve, and eventually the long ciliary nerve. The pupillary light reflex is actually much faster than actual visual processing. So light enters the retina and will reach the ipsilateral pretectal nuclei through the optic nerve. Now, nerves originating from the pretectal nuclei will then synapse into the Edinger-Westfall nucleus. Now, the Edinger-Westfall nuclei affect the parasympathetic functions of cranial nerve 3. This leads to pupillary constriction when light is shined through the eye. The pupillary light reflex is thus afferent through cranial nerve 2 and efferent through cranial nerve 3. Thus, a lesion of the optic nerve does not stop a bilateral reflex. Now the reason for this is that the bilateral response is due to the fact that the pretectal nuclei innervate both Edinger-Westfall nuclei, each of which then sends ipsilateral 
constrictor responses. When it comes to pupillary reflexes, you get one eye in, two eyes out. The only time that you will not get a bilateral reflex is if the parasympathetic portion of cranial nerve 3 is damaged. A Marcus Gunn pupil is seen when the retina or the optic nerve is damaged, as in multiple sclerosis. Because there's decreased light input, the pupils do not constrict as much when light is shunned into the effective eye. This is called the swinging flashlight test. When you shine the light into the non-affected eye, you produce a direct pupillary constriction in both eyes. However, when immediately swinging the flashlight to the other affected eye, there's less light perceived and the pupils will actually dilate compared to where they were before. Horner syndrome is very interesting. It is caused by impairment of the sympathetic system's innervation to the face. It includes a classic triad of ptosis, anhydrosis, and meiosis. You can also sometimes see anisocoria, which is unequal size of the pupils, which I think you can appreciate there. This picture is a good illustration for meiosis as well as ptosis. To understand all the causes of Horner, you have to understand the anatomy of the sympathetic tract, and that is one reason why this shows up so often on the boards. The first neuron of the sympathetic pathway originates in the autonomic regulatory nuclei in the hypothalamus. So that's our first neuron there. The tract descends to T1 and T2 in the intermedial lateral cell column. The preganglionic neurons exit at T1 and T2 and then ascend up the paravertebral sympathetic chain to the superior cervical ganglion. That's what's happening there. The third neuron then travels with the carotid plexus along the internal carotid artery to reach the facial muscles. Thus, any lesion affecting the brainstem, such as an infarct, or affecting the thoracic spinal cord, such as trauma, like we just discussed, or anything that affects T1 and T2 nerve roots, such as a pancose tumor in the apex of the lung, anything that affects the sympathetic chain, even affecting the carotid plexus, they can all cause Horner syndrome. Now, this classic triad that I mentioned, ptosis, anhydrosis, and meiosis, is one that you should definitely know. It's very high yield. Another high yield association you should know is that of a patient with a pancose tumor in the lung that presents with Horner syndrome. Papal edema is a clinical sign of what pathophysiological event? So you should know that papal edema is a fondoscopic sign and is usually indicative of increased intracranial pressure. There are six muscles that move the eye around and three cranial nerves that innervate those muscles. Cranial nerve three actually innervates four of the six muscles. It innervates the superior, inferior, and medial recti muscles as well as the inferior oblique. Cranial nerve 3 also controls pupillary constriction as well as the levator palpebrae muscle. Cranial nerve 4 only innervates the superior oblique muscle, while cranial nerve 6 innervates the lateral rectus. So how do you test these various muscles? One option is to have the patient's eyes follow your finger as you make an H. Now different muscles are necessary for specific segments of this motion. For example, the inferior oblique is isolated when the patient's eye is looking nasally and up, while the superior oblique is isolated when the eye is looking nasally and down. So which nerve would you be testing if you isolated the superior oblique? Well, then you would be testing cranial nerve 4.